spoken about gods who are persons previously, and I want to continue on that theme. So as we've seen, we can think of God as being a person, separate from creation, or as something impersonal, a force. And we can think of God as being transcendent, outside of creation, or imminent, inside of creation. And our view is that God uh, is impersonal and imminent, ultimate ground of existence, uh, ground of being, energy. The common view is diagonally opposed to that, that God is a person, either an incarnate person like Jesus or Krishna, or a person, at least Allah and Yahweh have desires. They're separate from creation and they want things and don't want things and you can possibly pray to them and get them to do something for you. So they're people, if not human people. So uh, in Christianity, uh, God creates the creation but is separate from it. And um, why not a woman creating the creation? Anyway, why not God as a woman? If God's going to be a person, why not a woman? I pointed out before how the idea of God as a person arises naturally in a child's hierarchy of existence. The child comes to realize there's dumb matter, chairs, tables, rocks. Then there's uh, maybe dolls which seem to be alive, there's animals which definitely are alive, there's other children, there's adults and the, the people that they can talk to and recognize them and have to say their name. And then above that maybe it's natural to feel there's the parent's parent. There's the ultimate uh, parent who really does know everything and really can do everything and that's what God is. Now there are some arguments for the idea of God as a person. Uh, which is basically theism. And uh, I want to talk about three of them and just briefly uh, give you my opinion about them. Now, whole books could be written about these, but I'm just going to talk about three. And those three arguments are intelligent design, the fine tuning of the universe, and the Kalam cosmological argument. Now, I've mentioned intelligent design before, and that's the idea that. Uh, certain things in the universe are so perfectly put together that they must have been designed by a designer. And this book was written by uh, Michael Behe, who is, or was at least at the time, a professor in a Pennsylvania college. And he focused on the bacteria flagellum. And the bacteria flagellum apparently has a tail which rotates and acts kind of like a, the motor on a motorboat. And apparently, if you look deeply into the biology of the bacteria flagellum, you see things that you'd see on a motor. And I guess that's what this is, a C-ring, an M-ring, an S-ring. I don't know exactly what this is because I'm not familiar with motors, torque generating surface. But apparently that's uh, the argument. And as I mentioned before, well, if the bacteria flagellum has been designed, so has the COVID-19 virus, so has the polio virus, so has malaria uh, bacteria, I think it is, so has uh, parasites which prey on human beings. And uh, one scientist once remarked that there's so many species of be beetles that, as opposed to species of animals, that uh, if um, there's an intelligent designer, the intelligent designer seems to have a, uh, a fondness for beetles. So the intelligent design argument, as I see it, gets on the train, but then hops off before the end, before the chain, train reaches its destination. If you follow the intelligent design argument to its logical conclusion, I believe you find a malevolent intelligent designer. Not that I believe there is one, but that's where I think the argument leads. People can point to the good in the world, but if a, if a man treats his wife wonderfully for some years and then kills her, you don't focus on the good and say, well, he's really a good person, except he killed her. So if the intelligent designer is designing uh, viruses and bacteria and parasites and mosquitoes, uh, it's hard to think good well of him. Now the next argument is the fine-tuning argument, which is kind of similar to intelligent design. People point out that the universe has 
physical constants, and they are so, if they differed slightly, uh, the universe couldn't exist as we know it, and maybe life couldn't exist. So, for instance, uh, here's, here's the physical constants, the speed of light, the uh, Planck's constant, the ratio of the proton to the electron's mass, and etc. And the idea is that if these differed by just one part in whatever, 10 billion or something, then the universe couldn't exist as it is, and life couldn't exist, and therefore the universe is fine-tuned for life. Well, 99.9999999% of the universe is not fine-tuned for life in the sense that if we were transported there, we would die in seconds. And even on the Earth, imagine being randomly transported to a point on the surface of the Earth. This is the Pacific Ocean. This is uh, South America. This is, I guess, Antarctica. This is probably Australia, maybe New Zealand. Your odds of getting transported to um, the middle of the ocean are very high if, if you were just transported at random. I believe Ambrose Bierce, an old author, once had defined the Earth as a planet three-fourths covered by water, created by God for man who has no gills. Anyway, and also, if it wasn't in the ocean, you could, you could find yourself in the North or South Pole, you could find yourself in the desert. The point is, even the Earth is hardly fine-tuned for at least human life. Only small parts of it are where you can, uh, you know, like the idea of Garden of Eden. If the whole Earth was a Garden of Eden where you just could walk undressed and the temperature was right and there was food just hanging from the trees ready for the picking. Well, that'd be a different story. But that's not the case. The third argument is called the Kalam cosmological argument or sometimes just the cosmological argument. And the idea there is, uh, well here it is, let's go through it. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, that is at the time of the Big Bang. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Now, People who make this argument really should stop there, but they go on to speculate about the cause must be timeless and spaceless because it has to be outside of time and space to create the universe, which is where time and space exist. It has to be immaterial because it's outside of the material universe. It has to be powerful because it created a universe. And then um, even there, these things seem kind of sketchy, but then they decide somehow that it has to be a person. So. There's a lot that can be said against this argument. One thing is a cause. What has a cause? A cause, a single cause. If I buy a car, it might be because it's economical. It might be because it has a good reputation for reliability. It might be because I like the way it performs. It might be because a friend of mine previously owned it, say it's a used car, and I know that they never abused it. They always took good care of it, etc. There is probably no one cause that would make me buy car. There's probably many causes. I have trouble thinking of something that has a cause, uh, but I don't think you can say that everything that begins to exist has a cause. The problem with that is if you change this to has multiple causes, when you get to the end of your argument, you've proven that gods exist, that gods have created the universe, which is not what the people who make this argument want to prove. Another thing, everything that begins to exist has a cause kind of includes the universe. So it's kind of like the uh, conclusion is tucked into the premise, hidden away. Another thing is, I believe in quantum mechanics, uh, they don't believe that everything has a cause, but you'd have to check with a physicist, but that's my belief. So what could be said about these three arguments is they're God of the gaps arguments. We see something that we don't understand uh, the fine-tuning of the universe. Uh, evolution, we do understand uh, how life originated, but some people don't accept that um, explanation. But anyway, we find something and we say, oh, there you go, God did it. This is uh, over 2,500 years ago, Hippocrates. People think epilepsy is divine because they don't understand it. Uh, someday we will understand epilepsy. epilepsy. At that moment, we will cease to believe it is divine. That's, uh, that's happened, right? And so it is with everything in the universe. Another example, which I mentioned previously, was the lightning rod. 
For centuries, people believed that lightning was a manifestation from God. I mean, what else was it? No one knew what it was. And uh, just like the fine tuning, people said, oh, there's something we don't understand that's from God. So Ben Franklin invents the lightning rod, and some religious people and uh, pastors or whatever, preachers, saw that as kind of a blasphemy because he was attempting to control, and I guess they would have said frustrate, the artillery of heaven. There's God throwing a lightning rod down, and there's Ben Franklin frustrating uh, God's target, and because the lightning is sitting in the lightning rod. So, uh, oh, by the way, that, that thing about uh, Ben Franklin comes from this book. Interesting book written in 1896, I believe, and Andrew White was one of the founders of Cornell University. And you can get this online, download it for free, and it's a pretty interesting book, over 100 years old. And here's what Neil deGrasse Tyson has to say about God of the God Gaps arguments. God becomes an ever receding pocket as science increases. At one time, God caused lightning and uh, was involved in epilepsy, and now, no longer. And one day, perhaps we'll understand the fine tuning of the universe, and uh, God will be a, at least a personal God, separate from the universe, will have been pushed back even more. Now, so what I'm saying here is that religions accept, here's something I got online, it says that God reveals himself these ways. And I would disagree with Revelation, not only the Bible, and with uh, incarnations. I'll get back to that in a minute, though. Let me say it now. We've talked about the uncreated light, the ultimate ground of existence, versus creatures. Uh, the ocean versus the wave. And I did admit in a previous uh, clip that I can't rule out the fact that there are more powerful waves in the ocean that maybe we would call a god. But if those beings exist, there's still waves in the ocean like us, still, still, still creatures like us. Uh, but anyway, for us, basically, I've drawn a line and I've said, well, I can accept love and the universe, I wouldn't call it creation, because that implies a creator, but the universe, and thought and reason, and I guess tradition, I mean, if a lot of people believe something, it's worth considering anyway. I wouldn't throw out tradition and put it on this side of the line. But I would reject the idea that there's a revelation from God and there's uh, actual incarnations that are uh, truly God, truly um, uh, on a level of what I would consider the one, the all, that in which we, which we live and move and have our being, the ultimate ground of existence. So, divine revelation. Uh, people believe it exists, and here the God who is is the God who reveals. That's typical, not only Christianity, any book, any religion, I suppose, that has a revelation, or at least well, many of them. But the question becomes, which God? And which revelation? Now, let's imagine, let's imagine that human beings originated 100 or 200,000 years ago. And let's suppose when the first human being lived, that human being could read. And let's suppose there was a book. And let's suppose that at no time in the past, in the history of human humanity, have there's been a, has there been a person who could not read or who not had access to that book. And let's suppose that book was so clearly written that no one disagreed about what it said. Everyone admitted that it says this and not that. And let's suppose the book had no internal contradictions. And let's suppose the book had no contradictions to scientific knowledge or to accepted fact. And let's suppose the book had a lot of good things like do not enslave, do not execute women for being witches, wash your hands frequently, especially if you're helping a woman in childbirth, etc., etc., etc. If that situation existed, then maybe I could believe, yes, there is a God who is a person, and this is that God's revelation. But nothing like that has existed, even in Christianity. Until the printing press was invented, most Christians didn't have access to scripture. 
and couldn't read it anyway because it was written in the original language and most Christians didn't have the education to read uh, ancient Greek or Hebrew. But for in some countries it was actually a crime to publish the Bible in the language of the people. It had to be in the original languages. So the Bible, the, the, the revelations have not been universally available, far from it. No one in North America ever read the Bible before Columbus landed in uh, 1492. So I find it impossible to accept the idea of uh, divine revelations and of gods who are persons who are fully and truly God. It's as if, I mentioned this before, uh, European Europeans first found their way to Easter Island, which was um, an island in the Pacific, I think 2,000 miles away from any landmass. It's a small island. It's not more than 10 miles in any direction. Had a few thousand people, and those people had their gods. And I doubt if any of those Europeans said, oh, this is the true God. I doubt it. They probably saw this as human creations. And we're kind of the same situation. The Earth is um, a tiny, tiny speck in the universe. And it seems to me that these gods who are persons and these revelations just don't measure up to the universe. I believe that this does. Okay, thank you.